1 Corinthians chapter 10. There might be a little misprint, but we'll get you there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to read four verses this morning. I feel like I am the guy that ordered a steak at a cheap restaurant, and I'm chewing on that first bite, and 30 minutes later I'm still chewing on that first bite. <laughs> There's just something about this chapter that radiates so many things to me. <coughs> You'll notice in your outline this is part three, and I'm afraid tonight's going to be part four. So we've been talking about Israel and how Paul depicts in this letter to the church at Corinth that Israel and all the experiences that happened to them, the Holy Spirit chose to put it here in, in, in this tenth chapter as a way for us to look at it and see an example from Israel and their journey with God and all the different instances that they went through, the difficulties, the presence of God, the power of God that was demonstrated, that all those things happened and they were put here in this passage of Scripture for us to learn from them. They're like a school teacher to us. We look at it and we learn from it. And Paul's already shown us in the last few messages from this 10th chapter that, listen, all these examples that happened to Israel, they run parallel to us in our journey in life as a child of God. We can learn great things from the nation of Israel. Today, Paul turns from the application of the truth of those instances in Israel to talking about an appeal that he makes to us in these four verses. Verse 11 says, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful. And he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Why in the world would he kind of end that thought, flee from idolatry? You know, that's probably the biggest misstep in the life of Israel. That if you read the Old Testament and you study the history of Israel, how many times did they turn from the one true God to worship some form of an idol? How many times in my life or your life as a child of God have we used some kind of substitute when we ought to be turning our face and our heart and our life to the Lord? How many times have we taken the truth of God and laid it aside for the truth that we might hear, untruth that we might hear from the world? How many times has that happened? So Israel is such a great example to us. So Paul makes an appeal to us. And, and, and he appeals to us that everything that happens in Israel's life, there's something for us to understand. There's an example, there's an admonition, there's a heeding, maybe it's even a warning. Because understand that when, when Israel was going through this journey with God in the Old Testament, the Old Testament pictures this all out in different phases. And, and we talk about it from a preacher's standpoint or a teacher's standpoint. And we look at the Bible in the Old Testament and we break it down to various phases that went on. We call them dispensations. And dispensations are only periods of time. Periods of time that we break it apart so we can understand this part and we can understand this part and this part. Those dispensations are pretty simple. First, there was the age of innocence. A time when Adam and Eve, the first created man and woman, were placed in a garden. They were placed in a perfect environment, so we call it the age of innocence. And then it moved to an age of conscience where Adam and Eve understood because they sinned, they disobeyed God, and because they sinned, they became conscious of sin. They became conscious of right and wrong. They became accountable to God for their sin. So we call that the age of conscience. And then you move from Adam all the way to the flood. And that, 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 that period of time when the flood came, that was a time from, 
after the flood and Noah and all of that transpired, there was an age of government that was established. And they lived for the first time under that age. And then came Abraham all the way to Moses. And it was an age of what we call promise, where God made all these incredible promises to the children of Israel. And then there was the age of law from Moses to Jesus Christ. A time where the law was established and all the do's and don'ts of that law that nobody could fulfill except one man. His name was? Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. And then we came to an age that we live in today. An age called grace. Amen. Amen. No longer a law that we couldn't live, but a law that we can understand and experience. It's an age of grace. And all of that is going to climax one of these days in that last dispensation that's called the Millennial Kingdom where we're all with the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So the Bible is broken down in periods for us to be able to understand those different journeys. Listen, all of us have different journeys with God. Now all of us are going into the Navy. What Sarah experiences is not going to be the same experience in the Navy that other people have. Guarantee it. Well, our journeys are different. And we go through those periods of time to learn and understand, most importantly, that God's with us. Amen? Amen. And we look in hope as we live in an age of grace that one day soon, because sin runs rampant, that we'll get to enjoy a millennial kingdom. So there's lessons to learn. Last, uh, I believe it was last Sunday night in our message, I talked about the downward spiral of Israel and how that parallels so much to us as a child of God. Because sometimes in our lives, we don't walk with God. We kind of walk away from God. Times in our lives that we're not walking in obedience, but we're walking in disobedience. Sometimes in our lives, we're not walking in the light, but rather we're walking in darkness. And that downward spiral of Israel, as you look as they fell and fell and fell further and further from God, how that parallels a backslider. Now, I know that's not a, 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 a contemporary term, okay? It's just an old biblical term. What it means is, is that sometimes children of God get backslidden. All right? You understand back? Okay? So you're backing away from God, and you're sliding down the slippery slope into sin and the world and all of its pleasures and all of its cares and all of that stuff. So that's the idea. Israel became backslidden. And guess what? Sometimes in our life, we become backslidden. You know how I know? I've been there. In fact, show of hands, how many of you would admit right now that there's been a time in your life that you've been backslidden? Oh my goodness. Look around. Okay? So all of us raise one hand. Ronnie made Deborah hold up both of her. <laughs> she slid way back, I guess. But the downward spiral. You think of the downward spiral. Look at Israel. They begin to complain and gripe. God give them manna. He rose it up just as frost would be on the ground. He gave them manna. They go out and they pick it up every day. How many times do we go out and pick up the Word of God and eat it and then turn around, not long after eating the Word of God, we reject it. Well, I want that Word. It doesn't fit my life anymore. So I'm going to reject the Word of God. Idolatry. I already mentioned it. They wanted something other than God. They had to worship something. When Moses is on the mount, getting the very commandments of God, they built a golden calf to worship. How many times do we turn to some alternative besides Jesus? The downward spiral. Immorality. All forms of immorality. They were involved in fornication. They were involved in uh, adultery. They were involved in homosexuality. They were involved in bestiality. And if you don't understand that, would ask mom and dad. But that's what they were. That's where we are. How many people do that? Tempting God. How many times in that downward spiral do we stop and say, well now Lord, listen, this is a tough place in my life. If you're really God, then you... How many times do we tempt God? And Israel did that. How many times do we drag the name of God in the mud, belittling the name of the Lord? 
And the end of the downward spiral is when we do like Israel did oftentimes and they turn back to the old life. I mean, the whole book of Hebrews that we're studying in Sunday school is all about them wanting to go back to the old life rather than what they had and treasure what they had in the Lord Jesus Christ. The downward spiral is so gradual. Did you notice that Paul said in verse 12, take heed? It's not like that you poop, trip and fall. It's not like that at all. The downward spiral is very slow, very gradual. Paul says, take heed, watch, be careful. It's not like you, you're, you're, you're in the downward spiral and in a moment's time you're here and the next thing you know you're flat on your face. It's not, don't fall. It's more like, look out. You're starting to fall. You're falling. You're going down. And then eventually you're down. Remember Peter? The downward spiral. Jesus said there would come a time when men, his disciples, his followers would betray him. Peter said, Lord, they'll all fail you. All those other 11 guys, they're going to fail you, but not me. Again, Peter said, nay, Lord, they'll all deny you, but not me. I've been following my rooster. <laughs> I'm learning. Lord, they'll let you down, but not me. I'll even die for you. <laughs> and guess what? He was flat of his face. The downward spiral. It's not like we stumble and we just fall flat of our face, folks. It's the gradual, downward, slippy slope that we get ourselves in. And here's the sad part. That Jesus said, Peter, that Satan, listen to me. Jesus told him, Peter, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. But then he said, I am praying. Jesus said, Peter, I'm praying for you that you will not fail. But guess what? He failed. He failed. And Jesus Christ was praying for him. Let me tell you something, folks. None of us are immune to the downward spiral. None of us. The best of us, when everything is said and done, are no more than Mephibosheth. When it was said of him that, well, He's lame on both of his feet. Remember Mephibosheth in the Bible? Remember that? You know who he was? Some of you looking at me. I, I'm getting that big question mark over Deborah's head right now. <laughs> Mephibosheth was the son of a man named Jonathan. Jonathan was the son of the first king of Israel. His name was Saul. Now Mephibosheth had a physical deformity. He was lame on both of his legs. But let me tell you something. That, when we're at our very best, we're lame in both of our feet. We are subject to fall. Any of us, the best of us, at our most shining moment, are subject to failure. Amen? None of us are strong enough to live this life that Jesus has called us to in this world on our own. We can't do it. Let me tell you something else about Mephibosheth. When David became king, and his dad, Jonathan, was David's best friend, and the Bible says they were knitted as friends like that, let me tell you something. He didn't forget about Jonathan's son. He invited him to the palace of the king. And he said, son, everything that your grandpa Saul owned, it's all yours. And he hired a family to take care of the farm so he didn't even have to worry about it. And when he ate, let me tell you something, when he ate from that day on, guess where he ate? He ate at the table of the king. We all fall. 
And we're all a bunch of cripples. You hear me? We're all a bunch of cripples. And we all are subject to falling and failing the Lord. But let me tell you something. He still considers us worthy to sit at the table one of these days. Fit for a king. And his name is King Jesus. So let's talk about temptation a little bit. Paul introduces it and he says in verse 13, No temptation is overtaking you such as common to man. <coughs> you realize that there's sporadic temptation that every one of us are tempted to? We encounter it all the time. For me, I listed it like this. Sex, drugs, alcohol, lying, cheating, immorality, you name it. We're all tempted by it. If I sit down in my TV and my wife's not around, trust me, it flashes up there. I can watch Saturday afternoon. I don't really care about NFL football because they disgrace the flag. That's just my opinion. But I want to tell you something. I sit down on Saturday afternoon and watch college football and even the commercials are seductive. Bob Barker, go to the beach, whatever it is. You don't think the enemy knows that? You don't understand that the devil knows my weakness as a man? Now, I don't know what you women do. Y'all sit there and watch days of our lives as the stomach turns and the, <laughs> <laughs> the belly turns. And you sit there and you listen to him talking about, hey, I'm sleeping with him. Well, guess what? I am too. What is his wife going to think if he finds out that both of us are sleeping with him? But that's what a lot of that is. Yeah, you don't think that enters our mind? You don't think the devil knows what our weakness is? And let me tell you something. If we ever let him get his foot in the door, then it's a weakness for our life. Whether it's sexual, whether it's drugs, addiction, alcohol, whatever it is. He knows. He knows my weakness. The devil knows me. There's sporadic temptation that we're tempted to do those things absolutely every time. And it doesn't matter if you're tempted to, to, to shoot your neighbor or if you're tempted to, I'll pick on Brody, my grandson. If you're tempted there taking a test in school and you look up on your neighbor's desk to find out what he wrote down as the answer and you take his answer and you put it on your paper, that's called what? Cheating. Cheating. And let me tell you something. Cheating's a sin, murder's a sin. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And it's, it begins that downward spiral. Because guess what? Next time I'm taking that test, it was easy to find that answer over there. Guess what? I might find one over here too. And one over there. And one up there. And the next thing you know what? I'm a cheater. That's who I am. That is my way of life. And that's the way the devil works. And he also tells us, not only is all of these things common, that we all have to deal with it in life. Amen? I mean, we're, none of us are immune to it. He also tells us how to evaluate it. We understand the commonality of it. And, and he said, look at, look at the example. In verse 11, look at the example of Israel. We learn from them how common it is for them to make those mistakes and end up in so much trouble. He took them through the water. Hey, he led them by a cloud. When they were thirsty, he gave them drink from a rock. When they were hungry, he gave them bread on the ground. When they decided that they didn't like eating so much bread, he filled their nostrils running over with quail, with meat. And yet still they complained. He took them by a cloud to lead them by day through a sea on dry land. And on the other side of that dry land, he closed the ocean up so it swallowed up all of their enemies. And they could never go back home. And what in the world did they do? They go to the land that he promised them in all of this journey after seeing God's hand and God's hand and God's hand and God's hand. And what did they do? They hear a report and they say there's giants in the land. We can't go there. My goodness gracious, God took a stick and made a rock bring forth water gushing like a spring. God took an ocean and spread it apart and made the ground dry so you could walk on it. You don't think God couldn't use that stick or his word to take care of giants? Come on. 
Come on. Folk, we see God's hand in our lives. We see God deliver us. We see God protect us. We see God caring for us. We see God providing for us. And what do we do? Oh, me. How am I going to get through this week? How soon we forget. Temptation comes. Sporadically. But it's all common to us. All temptation. All temptation. Comes from three sources. Either the lust of the flesh. The lure. The lure. Of the world. Or the lies of the devil. That's the only three places temptation is going to come. Let me tell you something. Half the battle, listen to me, half the battle is knowing the enemy. You listen? You got half of it won just knowing the enemy. One of my favorite movies of all time is the movie called Patriot. Huh? Great movie. Great movie. There's a guy named Benjamin Martin. That's the main character. That's Mel Gibson in the movie. Let me tell you something about him. He was a man of war. He fought the Indian Wars many, many years ago with the colonists and the Indians at war against one another. He learned. He was a colonel. And when the British came over here to take this new world, he stood up and fought once more. After he lost two sons, he went back into war. But let me tell you something. He knew General Cornwallis. He studied him. He intently learned how Cornwallis always went to battle and how he would always defeat his enemy because Cornwallis, he was smart. He would keep a regiment back and he would wait into the heat of the battle when everything was going on, and then he would send in that last regiment to mop up and to wipe them out. Let me tell you something, Benjamin Martin knew the enemy well. He had his own cavalry regiment sitting off in the woods, and Cornwallis said, oh, I've already won the victory. Send everybody in. What? Yeah, send them all in. And guess what? He got his tail whooped. Because Benjamin Martin saved his hidden regiment to the end. And he kicked Cornwallis all the way back to Britain in shame. Half the battle is knowing your enemy. Who is our enemy? The devil. Who is our enemy? Sin. The devil. Not your mama. It's not your daddy. It's not your brother. It's not your sister. It's not your neighbor. It's not your boss, it's not your co-worker, not your employee, not your sister-in-law. I mean, I could keep going on here for a while, folks. That's not your enemy. Your enemy is old smutty face. The devil. The devil. You know why? Because he failed too. He had a downward spiral. And he ended up flat of his face. But let me tell you something about him. He, he uses three things according to 1 John 2.16. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Half the battle is understanding the enemy. Let me tell you something about the enemy. He has spent 6,000 years now studying us. Let me tell you something. The devil knows you better than you know yourself. Mm -hmm. You hear me? He knows you better than you know yourself. He understands the great lures that we fall to. Listen, he found it out with Adam and Eve in the garden. And they were quite effective, weren't they? Took down the first man and woman. Listen, he has been using those same tactics forever and ever and ever. And let me tell you something. Folk, listen to me. There is no advance in holiness that renders us safe from temptation. 
There is no advance in holiness that would ever render us safe you know you do. from the devil. Jesus was tempted by the devil. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let me tell you something. The tricks that, that Satan used on Adam and Eve didn't work on Jesus. He tried the same thing, but guess what? It didn't work. You know what he said to Adam and Eve? If you'll partake of that fruit that's forbidden, I know what God said. God said if you eat that fruit, you'll die. Enjoy everything else in the garden. I know that. That's all a bunch of belong. Let me tell you something. The day you eat of that fruit, you'll become like God. Not. The day they ate of that fruit, they came further than they would ever been from God. Because inside they died. And they were separated from God. They sinned. That's what sin does. It separates us from God. Let me tell you something. He's been doing that over and over and over again. And I don't care where you think you are spiritually. You'll never be too far from the devil to ensnare you. I have a good friend. Remember um, uh, when my, my friend from Vietnam came and shared his story briefly? Remember the big old brawny guy? Kind of looked like Jacob, like Jacob's brother. Hey, remember him? Thomas is his name. Thomas has been on an incredible journey with God the last three years. Let me tell you, tell you something Thomas told me. A few months ago, guess where he went? He went to Tibet. He spent 30 days in a monastery with the monks. He studied, he prayed, and he read. 16 hours a day and slept eight. 30 days away from the world. And I had to ask him the question. I said, Thomas, was there ever a time when you were there in that environment that you ever faced any kind of temptation? He said, absolutely. Folks, there's no place you can go. There is no rank that you could ever achieve in this life that you're going to be spiritually immune from the devil and his attack. You just can't do it. He's everywhere looking to cause us to trip and to fall. He entices us with a little to get us to do even more. To pull us away from God. To pull you away from God. All the tricks that the devil has ever used or will ever use have all been exposed to us by the Word of God. In Ephesians 6, 11, Paul called it the wiles of the devil. In 2 Corinthians 2 and 11, he called it, How in the world can we be ignorant of his devices? Every one of those things have been exposed all through man's history. It's still the same old way, using the world, the flesh, and evil spirit. He has no new tricks up his sleeve. All he has is common to man. Common to man. So I'm going to close there. And I guess we'll pick up from there tonight. The devil wants you to fail. But let me tell you something. Here's the flip side of that. God wants you to win. Not just like Jacob was talking about at salvation. He wants you to win at this life. Because the more that you live this life as a winner for Jesus Christ, the greater the influence that you have on those around you. The greater the light is that shines on those that walk in darkness. The greater representative you are of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sarah, do not let the devil defeat you. Because inside of you is, is deposited the Holy Spirit of God, and He is greater than he that's in the world. Amen. And Jesus said, I've overcome the world. Don't give Jesus any kind of pity party why you failed. You failed because you did not use everything that He has put at your disposal or my disposal to keep us from failing. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We have the Word of God to guide us. We have the warning in Scripture that the devil is going to tempt us. And if we understand the enemy, we're already halfway to victory. Amen. And if we understand Jesus, 
we get complete victory. Every time the devil tempted Jesus before he ever began his ministry, what did Jesus do? One thing is common. What did he do? Pray. Yeah. Took him to the pinnacle of a temple. He said, see those stones down there? Make them into bread. Jesus said, eh, 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 eh. Man will not live a bread alone. Took him up on the high mountain. All of those, all the kingdoms that you see, if you'll bow down and worship me, they're yours. <laughs> you know what Smutty Face didn't even understand? <laughs> Jesus is going to be king of kings and lord of lords. It's all his anyway. Crazy guy. But Jesus always answered him with the word. And you know what he wants to do? He wants to steal the word. He wants to steal the truth of God from your life. Because if he can steal the truth of God from your life, guess what? He can cause you to fall and fail and give in to temptation. The truth will set you free. The truth of Jesus Christ on the cross that saved three beautiful souls yesterday, that same truth will save your soul today. If you're willing to admit your sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ and what he did alone, you'll save it. And if you made a mistake, guess what? I have too. But he forgives me. Amen. And if I make another mistake, and I will, and I ask him, guess what? He'll forgive me. Yes. Because he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from every unrighteous thing. 1 John 1 9. I heard that. You know where that is? I have to claim that quite often. Amen. How about you? Would you claim it? If you've messed up? Jesus said, if you'll admit it, if you'll confess it, if you'll tell me about it, and ask me to forgive, I will. Because of the blood that I shed for you. <coughs> Fathers, we come to a moment such as this, a time of uh, searching and seeking and just asking ourselves, where am I in regards to the word that I've heard? What, what will I do with the truth of God that is spoken? How will I respond to a call to salvation? To a call of forgiveness? To a call of rededication? the call to second chance. God help us to be willing to admit our weakness, to admit our failures, but to turn and to trust you in what you have done, what you have provided for us. Father, we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing what number do you